Hello, good afternoon, welcome to Communities Live here on Sheffield Live 93.2 FM and we have author Jane McNeese, good afternoon. Hi Chris, good afternoon. So, I mean, you recently uh, made a, a new book called Strength Not Deficit, so tell us a bit about that. So Strength Not Deficit is the the second book that I've launched uh, about autism. So the theme is autism. And in this particular book, I've talked about um, the strengths that sit within autistic people. Um, I've actually challenged some of the systemic issues. For example, the way that we diagnose people autistic at the moment is we we tend to go through a, a deficit approach. We say, what is this person challenged by? And if they are challenged sufficiently in three particular areas, then we will diagnose them autistic. But I actually take a different angle that says, well, because we're going in through that approach, we're actually missing people who, yes, are challenged, but also highly capable because of the strengths that sit behind the autism. And this particular group are the ones that largely will get missed in society because, uh, in particular, because of ableism, they will be uh, basically be presumed too capable to be autistic. I mean, I, I want to talk about, if it's all right with you, uh, I want to talk about your personal experiences, if that's okay with you. I mean, how yeah. did you find out that you had autism? So I found out I was autistic at the age of, of 44, and I actually worked it out for myself in the end. Um, very long story, but um, a parent friend whose son was diagnosed autistic actually signposted me to a parent support group, and it was a Facebook group group that I was just scrolling through one Saturday morning and I came across a social media post that was titled girls with autism and it was like a spider diagram and around it there were 23 traits and I literally went around these traits and went tick 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 and what I did next was very telling of the fact that I'm autistic I grabbed an A4 sheet of paper and a pen I wrote all 23 down wrote a detailed rationale for why I met each of them scored each out of 10 10 being the highest and I scored 219 out of 230 on my pseudo self-assessment um what it, that doesn't reflect is the 44 years prior to that where I was misdiagnosed with mental illness where I was desperately searching for what was wrong with me. And you have to understand that prior to that, that's what I thought. I thought there must be something wrong with me. I seem to be the common denominator here. You know, what what is wrong? Why do I never quite feel that I belong or that I fit in? So at this point, I self-identify that I'm autistic. And I have to say, in the society that we're living at the moment, with the system as it stands, if you are waiting for the system to find you, there's a good likelihood that it won't, especially if you are female, if you are high achieving for all the reasons I said earlier, and if you socially mask at a high level. And that that was me. So at this point of knowing, I could have just accepted and self-identified as autistic, but actually at the time... I wasn't aware that that was option was open to me. And even if I had have been, I wouldn't have taken it. I needed to know with certainty that I was autistic. So I sought out a clinical professional who could assess me. And a year later, on the 22nd of June, 2021, at the age of 45, I was diagnosed autistic. And I was told I was autistic within five minutes of being in the assessor's room. She said, I I've read all your pre-information, your biographical history. I've been on your website. I've read your blogs. I can tell you now you're autistic. All that we will do today is go through the due process, which she did for about four hours, where we answered lots of questions. Um, and she, at the end of that, said, my clinical judgment hasn't changed. You are autistic. And I cannot even begin to tell you how life changing that moment was. I mean, I, I've got to, I've got to admit to, uh, to you as well that I have a um, dyspraxia and Asperger's. And I mean, we didn't find out that I had Asperger's till later in life, uh, about in the early 20s. But uh, as for the dyspraxia part, I found that when I was um, when I was young, so I, about um, when I was in the primary school. Mm. And um, it, I mean, at first, I mean, it was quite hard to accept that I had dyspraxia. But now, now that I've come later in life, I've actually kind of le learned to live with it, and it's actually made my life better because mm. it's it's made me the person who I am today. 
Yeah, yeah. I think some of the acceptance, um, the challenges with it that many people might have is where we might at the time have our own ableist viewpoints, where we might think, oh, actually, if I have this condition, therefore I'm some some kind of lesser person. Or if we pick up that the people around us have those ableist viewpoints, if either of those things are present, then we kind of don't accept the, the label. And at the end of the day, all of these neurodivergent conditions, they're just brain types, yes. just like neurotypical is. It's just a brain type. The only thing that's made it seem negative is the ableism that surrounds it, the idea that we are all incapable or somehow lesser beings for being the people we are. And if, if you compare something like neurodiversity, the whole of neurodiversity with something like biodiversity, we need all brain types if we are to survive as a human race. And it would be very arrogant of any one brain type to think neurodiversity in the human race can exist without one of us. If you track back things like autism, there is evidence we existed when we were cave people. Neurodivergent people are very nocturnal. We don't sleep very well. We would have been the people who stood outside the caves and made sure that other people, the, typically the neurotypicals, didn't get eaten by saber-toothed tigers and bears so that we survived as a human race. And there is still evidence nowadays that we work in things like security to help keep the human race safe. Um, there's lots of evidence throughout history that we were needed and that we still are. And I think that the challenge we've got is the perception that somehow all neurodivergent people need to change. We must be the ones to adapt and that if we adapt, everything will be perfect. If we adapt, the human race is at stake. I mean, I, I would like to hear your opinion. I mean, what can we do more as a nation to you know, try and identify more people with autism. Because like you say, the systems that we got in place, sometimes they don't work. Or they don't, yeah. they can't, you can't. They're not, um, like you say, the more, we don't identify as um, autism, unfortunately. So what can we do more to change that? Yeah. Um, one thing we really, really need to do is raise awareness of non-stereotypical autism. The stereotypical autistics got found, and that's where the stereotype came from. Yeah. But what they didn't find is people like myself who don't fit the stereotype. Now, in the last year or so, I've actually worked out the conditions for self-identification. And they are, number one, you must be self-aware. Now, prior to my diagnosis, I turned myself inside out trying to work out what was wrong with me. Yes. The second one is you have to be searching for what's wrong. Yeah, you, you have to be searching or if you're not searching at the very least, you must be receptive to a truth you do not yet know. And the third one is you have to have awareness and information in front of you about non stereotypical autism. Now, for most of us, we had number one and number two in abundance. I was searching desperately. I was highly self aware to the point of self obsession, yeah. but I was missing the last one. And the moment that social media post was in front of me, now bear in mind that social media post was a post of less than 90 words and it took me less than 60 seconds after 44 years of searching, mm -hmm. I worked it out straight away. So I've identified that if all three conditions are present, you will find yourself. The difficulty then is you've got to convince the people who aren't so aware of non-stereotypical autism. And that's where the gatekeepers and the barriers will move in. So it's no good just raising awareness in people who are suffering and searching. We've got to raise that same awareness in the clinical professionals, in school staff, anyone who is in a position of power who can effectively utilize that power to stop someone finding out their neurotype, which I believe is a human right. We deserve to know our neurotype. Um, and at the moment, the people who are aff afforded the privilege to diagnose us are people who've been through a set of sort of systems and tests. But actually, if you speak to most neurodivergent people, we're really good at spotting it ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we have the tools, we have the pattern spotting, we are exceptional. But our society offers that privilege of clinical judgment to clinical professionals only. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of chat. I, I don't need a diagnosis to tell me I have feet. <laughs> I yeah. actually don't really need a diagnosis to tell me that I'm autistic. The behaviours are all there. Mask as I will, underneath that, there is everything you would expect in an autistic person. 
So for me, those three criteria, we've got to test them scientifically because they are my own theory at the moment. They need research to back that up. Um, and I think if we can create those conditions in people, um, and it really comes down to the last one in the main, um, number three, we've got to raise awareness of non-stereotypical autism. And I hear a lot in the autistic community where people say, oh, we're done with awareness. It's not about awareness. It's about support and acceptance. We're not done with awareness yeah. until everyone is found. And just, just to add a point on that, Chris, if, if anyone of your listeners is thinking, well, not everyone wants a label, not everyone needs to be found. I My interest is in the people who are suffering. If you're not suffering, then yeah, maybe you don't need that. Maybe you don't. But those that are suffering, are usually, uh, they're usually searching for why. They want to know why. Mm -hmm. Now, I have three big reasons why we should find autistic people. And they all come down to one thing, saving autistic lives and increasing our life expectancy. The first one, and I come with this with a little bit of a health warning, the first one is suicide prevention we carry a high suicidality so we need to find out who the autistic people are so we can ask them questions like have you have ever had thoughts of suicide oh okay you have have you thought about putting a safety plan in place would you like me to help you with that so that if that happens again we can help you keep you safe from that from that threat the second one is child protection and safeguarding autistic people carry a lot of vulnerabilities we tend to lack the theory of mind, so we don't see things like ill intention until it's happening. We overshare. We overtrust. It's a gift. We see the good in people, and not everyone is always good. So we don't mm -hmm. see the bad till it's happening, until it's too late, and the bad things have happened to us. Um, and we know the research stacks up that, for example, women who are autistic are something like three times more likely to experience uh, coercive sexual control. And many of us were abused in childhood. Yes. And the last one is, so just, just going back to that, we need to find out who they are so we can help educate um, autistic people about predators and raise awareness of their vulnerabilities so they can be careful with boundaries. If we don't know who they are, then how can we assist with that? And the last one is identity. Autism is not just a medical diagnosis, it's an identity. And if you are searching for yourself, in an identity if you're looking for something and you can't find that missing piece of you you will go and find it elsewhere now if we go looking in the places that society really accepts like academics and careers and professions then that's great society loves that but what if i go searching for my identity in gang culture what if i go searching for belonging in an online eating disorder group that is contributing to the problem rather than the solution yeah or maybe an online self-harm group where I get that belonging but actually it's causing me a great deal of risk that puts our lives at risk so it goes sure. back to what I said at, at the first point that finding autistics isn't about we never wanted a label it wasn't about a fashion trend mm -hmm. we wanted to find ourselves because it will help us to survive in a world that is not built for us and the reason to find autistic people isn't to dump a label on them but it's to help them survive I definitely agree with you. I mean, it's definitely, I think it's like you say, it's part of our identity now. And mm -hmm. it's not like you say, it's not about putting a label on you. It's not, it's about finding who you really are. And I mean, it took me a good long time to find out who I actually was. I mean, because I was a completely different person when I was younger. Um, because I struggled um, knowing when I had dyspraxia and Asperger's when I was at a, a, a later time. But uh, eventually I overcame that and now I see the positive sides. And, you know, I'm, we need more people to, to actually get more to see the positive sides of having Asperger's and autism and dyspraxia and, and every other condition there is out there as well. Uh, yeah, well and it is... Sorry, yeah, Chris, it is a, a process and I can hear in your story that you went through that process that I've kind of been through as, as well. Um, certainly at the point I got diagnosed and, and I suppose the point where I self-identified, I went from that thinking of I'm broken, there's something wrong with me to, oh, there's not actually something wrong with me. I'm just different. 
but yeah. since then so so the first book uh, that i published um, a couple of years ago the umbrella picker talks about that journey to that point where i suddenly realize oh i'm just different i'm not wrong and then the second book really reflects on that next part of that journey where i go from okay i'm not just different well, wait a minute my difference was my strength all along. It's the thing that's created my successful business that allows me to run marathons, that allows me to memorize seven and a half thousand words in three days. Yeah. And um, things that I did as part of my university degree. But I didn't get my diagnosis because of the strengths. They went in through the deficit. So they said, yeah, but actually in social situations, you're going to struggle and you do struggle. You've told us that. Suffering and, and success exist together. They're not mutually exclusive. They're in fact bedfellows of one another in in most cases, but I think for most of us, we we went through a grieving process for the person that was, and that's a long process, and we eventually moved to a place where we go, do you know what? I'm kind of comfortable with who I am. Society still mm-hmm. isn't. There's work to be done there, and I eat, live, sleep, and breathe that battle amongst many other artistic people, uh, people like yourself, Chris, I think we're all fighting for that kind of change. Um, I'm going to make a prediction here and now as well. Watch the numbers grow in the next 10, 15 years. Our voice will become louder. We won't be the minority, minority group that we are at the moment because what's happening is because of the ability of social media to take non-stereotypical autism information out to the general public, we are no longer reliant on the clinical professional to be the first person to go, hmm, you're showing the traits of autism. Yeah. And if we, as I said, if we wait for that, we'll wait a very long time. We may never be found. But at the moment, we've got enough autistic people themselves doing things like this radio interview and saying, hear this, this is what it can look like. And we're, we're reaching more people. And those people, yes, they might struggle to get a diagnosis because of the delayed assessment process and all the issues with that. Some will circumvent it. Some will have the finances in the bank to go, do you know what? I'm, I'm going to go for a private assessment. And that will be the route they take. It was the route I took because I'd waited too long already. Yeah. I mean, it was uh, my mum that found out that there was something wrong with me and... Uh... That's how I found out how I, how I was, and but I mean um, I'm gonna go off this topic now. But uh, I want to and thank you for sharing that with me. So thank you very much for sharing your story. Uh, but I want to talk about this book. I mean, for anybody that wants to um, read this book, uh, how can people get a copy? So the book is available really in all the usual places. It it kind of starts off on Amazon. So um, that's a readily available place that you can order it. So you can get it in paperback or Kindle at the moment. Um, I'm hoping by probably this time next year, it will be available in audio because I'm always very mindful that not everyone wants to take their information in through the written word. Um, Some people will want the, the spoken word. The first book, The Umbrella Picker, will be available in audio format in about, um, I'm going to say, 40 to 45 days time. Um, so that one will be a bit more accessible. Um, so, yeah, Strength Not Deficit is available on Amazon. And it's also gone out to another organization that disseminates it globally. So it will end up in places like Waterstones, um, Blackwell, uh, in America, Barnes and Noble, so the the big sort of um, retailers of right. books. So I, I was just gonna, I was just gonna ask you, was there any like physical copies? But thank you for answering that. Um, for anybody that is listening to this uh, interview right now, and they are questioning about us, I mean, um, is there any uh, information that you can give to people like that who are currently looking and like? Let's say that they want some help in finding who we are or if they need a bit of guidance, where would we turn to? I think there's various sources of information. As an artist, I always say gather from all places, but, you know, try and make sure that where you're going is is as reputable as possible. Um, The NHS is obviously a a good starting point of evidence-based information, but I would also look towards the leading autism charities. You've got places like the National Autistic Society, but I also think it's a really important thing to hear the voices of autistic people. If you were to read my first book, The Umbrella Picker, or or perhaps the second book as as well, you would, if you are autistic and all those three components that I mentioned previously are present, you'd work it out by the end of my book. Remember, I worked it out in a social media post of less than 90 words, 84,000 in my first book. 
there's a really good chance that by the end of it, you'll work it out. Now, I caveat that a little bit in as much as every autistic person is different. But what I tend to find, particularly amongst women or those people who identify as female, is that when they read or hear my story, they look at it and we are a mirror to one another. And that's how they work out that they too are autistic. They go, wait a minute, actually, I struggle in that situation. And I seem to have these different masks of me in in different places that exhaust me. And they start to, all the parallels resonate. And that's how they work it out. So a combination of the the stuff that's out there through, for example, the NAS, the uh, NHS, but also the lived experiences, you you would work it out. If you are self-aware enough, you've got to know yourself first and sure. foremost and i i can't give you that bit that that's for you to work out yeah. the second bit the searching i don't know if you're searching but i tend to find those that suffering are they're looking for why well, why do i suffer with these physical health issues with these mental health issues with certain social situations so that amounts to quite a lot of suffering for and and did so for many of us so yeah, when those three things are present, um, they tend to work it out. But gather information, reflect on it. Um, I don't actually think it's too difficult to work out when mm. you've got the right stuff in front of you. And the research shows that those people who self-identify rather than a professional identifying them, based on the research, are not usually wrong. So they did some research where they actually tested, you know, those who'd self-identified and then what that looked like after a formal official assessment. And most were correct. And uh, my final question for you, because we're coming near to the end of this interview. Uh, For anybody that is listening to this interview right now, what would you like to say to our listeners? Accept autistic people as they are. Listen to them. Learn to understand their world cooperate at the moment we have a world where 80 percent of people are neurotypical 20 percent of people are neurodivergent and the expectation is that the neurodivergent should change to become neurotypical we need all neuro um, identities neurotypes brain types to cooperate together none of us should be the ones that have to change fully we should all adapt to meet one another's needs it's about cooperation um, but we do need to be accepted who as who we are and that comes down to safety if you can make us to feel safe that it is okay to be different then we won't mask you will get the real me and you'll get many autistic people who start to become themselves. It, the top and bottom is safety. If we are not safe, we will mask, we will hide our autism and you won't get the best out of our brain types. And the autistic brain type is pretty good. It's not superior to any other brain type. But when you get the best out of it, it will it will open your mind. Jane, th- thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you very much. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And thank you, Chris. Thank you to your listeners as well. And just giving me that opportunity to share my story. It's absolutely invaluable. Thank you, everyone.